I'm Nate Kazmerick, uh, President and Director of the Federal Society's uh, Practice Groups. Uh, our thanks to you all for joining us this weekend. Uh, we certainly hope you are uh, having fun at this year's NLC. I'd also like to say thank you to our practice group leadership and our Federal Society staff who have been instrumental in putting together our convention programming. We've been looking forward to this special session on the Second Amendment and the aftermath of Bruin, and it is our good fortune to have a distinguished panel join us along with an excellent moderator. You can check out the full bios for our entire panel in our convention app and on our website. But quickly, a very abbreviated bio for the Honorable Judge Stephen Menashe. <laughs> Fans, the fans are here, Judge. <laughs> Judge Manassi serves on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Prior to his appointment in 2019, he served as a special assistant and associate counsel uh, to the president in the White House. He also served in the U.S. Department of Education. He is a graduate of Dartmouth College and Stanford Law School. Please welcome our panelists and Judge Manassi. Well, thank you very much, Nate, and oops. Well, thank you very much, and welcome to our panel on the aftermath of Bruin, what's next at the state level. Uh, as you all probably know, in the Bruin decision, the Supreme Court uh, invalidated New York's uh, May issue standard for awarding handgun carry licenses. And in doing so, it said that courts should evaluate gun regulations in the states not by reference to the familiar tiers of scrutiny, but according to a standard derived from history and tradition. And so it means that states will have to reevaluate, or some states will have to reevaluate their regulations, and courts will have to apply that new standard uh, and figure out uh, uh, how it works. Um, and so to help us puzzle through uh, these questions, we have a distinguished panel of experts we're first going to hear a bit about the Bruin decision in its full context, and then we're going to uh, hear some notes of caution and perhaps a critique of that decision, and then talk about next steps in litigation and in state regulation. So I will introduce our panelists briefly in the order in which they will speak. Uh, we're first going to hear from Stephen Holbrook. Stephen Holbrook is a senior fellow at the Independent Institute, and he's taught legal and political philosophy at George Mason University, Howard University, and Tuskegee Institute. He has argued and won three cases before the Supreme Court, including Prince versus United States. Uh, he's written several books on gun control and the Second Amendment, including The Founders, Second Amendment, Origins of the Right to Bear Arms. His scholarly articles have appeared in journals such as the, law, uh, the Journal of Law and Policy and Law and Contemporary Problems. He received his JD from Georgetown, his PhD in Social Philosophy from Florida State. Uh, we'll next hear from Professor William Merkel, who's an associate professor of law at the Charleston School of Law. Uh, having previously taught at Washburn Law School, Columbia Law School, and Oxford University. He's the co-author of the book, The Militia and the Right to Arms, or How the Second Amendment Fell Silent. And he's published articles in the Chicago Kent Law Review, Connecticut Law Review, and History, and the Law and History Review, among other publications. His scholarship on the Second Amendment has been cited, among other places, by Justice Breyer in his dissenting opinion in McDonald versus City of Chicago. He graduated uh, from Columbia Law School uh, and from Johns Hopkins University. And last, we'll hear from Mark Smith. Mark Smith is a visiting fellow in pharmaceutical public policy and law in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Oxford. He's the presidential scholar and a senior fellow in law and public policy at the King's College, and a distinguished scholar and senior fellow of law and public policy at the Ave Maria School of Law. He hosts the Four Boxes Diner YouTube channel, which provides scholarly and historical analyses of the Second Amendment, and he's the author, among other books, of Disrobed, the new battle plan to break the left stranglehold on the courts. He was a founding partner of the law firm Smith Valair and also litigated at Kazowitz, Benson, uh, Torres, and Friedman, and Skadden Arps. Uh, he graduated from New York University School of Law and the University of South Carolina. And so with that, why don't we turn first to uh, Stephen Holbrook. Thank you, Your Honor, if I may approach the bench. Sure. Oh, the mic. All right. 
Is this something I'm supposed to know how to It's came on, on. It came. It came on by itself. Okay, I'm low tech. So it's a, what a pleasure it is to be here, speak about the Bruin case. So in 10 minutes or less, I'm supposed to go through, uh, what was it, 150 pages and tell you, to steal that and to tell you what the, the case said. That's what I'll try to do. Um, it, of course, it was authored by Justice Thomas. It was a, a six to three opinion. And it held that the state of New York and, and also five other of the usual suspect states had invalid um, permit systems to carry firearms. Um, you cannot predicate exercise of a constitutional right on the showing of need to, to a, um, a government official. Um, New York argued that you had to show a, um, a type of need like self-defense that you had to be able to prove before you could get a carry permit. Uh, so there, there are six states that had laws of that type and that's what was basically invalidated in the Bruin case. What, what do we look at when interpreting a constitutional right? Now, this applies to the Second Amendment, but there's been discussion recently about whether the same rules are gonna be applicable to uh, uh, other constitutional rights like First Amendment, free speech, and whatnot. Uh, first of all, uh, we look at the plain text. Um, that would seem to be a no-brainer. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But there's the plain text and there's what used to be the plain text. Before District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, the plain text was interpreted by many lower courts uh, to as follows. The people really didn't mean the people as it did in the First and Fourth Amendments. The people really meant the states, and it really meant the National Guard, and it really meant the militia, anything but the people. Arms did not include handguns. Now, we have a reversal of that. Arms don't include semi-automatic rifles. But anyway, uh, that's the basis of um, our first mode of interpretation. You look at the plain text, and if the activity falls within the plain text, it's presumptively protected. And to find an exception to that, you have to look at history. Uh, you look at the uh, historical traditions, particularly around the founding period. One thing the Bruin Court did away with was the so-called two-step process. Um, you don't look just at step one, which is text and history, but you look at intermediate scrutiny. Uh, you look at weighing the government interests and, and balancing out the constitutional right, which is the way most of these cases came down. Um, as Justice Thomas artfully said, that's one step too many. So he X'd out the two step, the second part of the two step process that all the lower courts had um, basically adopted. So um, we, we no longer are looking at um, judges making empirical ju uh, judgments. Um, we're not looking at deference to legislatures. If you look at Justice Breyer's dissent in the Heller case, you'll see uh, deference is everything and, and it's enough to override the constitutional right. So um, what history do we look at? In terms of restrictions, what kinds of restrictions existed at the founding? Do we have similar problems today? How did they address that at the founding? Um, do we do things in a radically different way with the same problems? If, if we're trying to do that, it's, it's presumptively invalid. So uh, there's history and there's history. And not all history, is, as Justice Thomas wrote, is created equal. So uh, we look at around 1791, there was a debate about whether we also look at 1868 when the 14th Amendment was adopted, because that made the Second Amendment applicable to the states. Um, but the tendency is laws that were closest to the founding are those that were, would be considered more presumptively valid if they were laws that were in a number of jurisdictions. You wouldn't take one law from Boston from 1780 and say that, that that rule would be applied universally and that it's valid because it existed in one jurisdiction. Um, there, there's two issues where 
I, I think we have a um, um, kind of a prediction of how cases in the future might be decided. One was in the definition of arms. Uh, the court said that the term arms is not limited to 18th century type arms. Um, if it's a modern bearable arm, if it's a modern instrument that uh, facilitates the right of self-defense, then it's presumptively um, protected. Um, there's a, a common law exclusion for dangerous and unusual arms, the carrying of dangerous and unusual arms. And in the Heller case, the, the court identified like modern military weapons like M16s. Um, but arms that are in common use would be protected. And I think that bodes well for maybe one of the next issues that the court would take on, which is the bans in certain states on semi-automatic rifles because they are in common use. And then the other current issue uh, would be what kinds of sensitive places can uh, firearms be banned at? And the court um, noted some of the traditional exceptions that no one is contesting. I, I think the top of the list in my mind would be courts. Uh, we all know that you, uh, you know, judges make their own rules for courts and most uh, jurisdictions ban taking firearms in courts. And the nice thing about courts nowadays, they have metal detectors, they have bailiffs who are armed, they protect you if you go into this gun-free zone. Also, polling places, legislative assemblies, schools, uh, these are the kinds of exceptions. But since New York was basically arguing that every, th every place can be a sensitive place, uh, Justice Com uh, Thomas cautioned that the whole island of Manhattan is not a sensitive place. He got that out of the way right at the beginning. And it, as you may know, and I think uh, Professor Smith might talk about, New York has uh, passed a law in reaction to Bruin that identifies just about everywhere as a sensitive place. Uh, Justice Thomas wrote that just because there's a lot of people there and they have some police there protecting people, that doesn't make it a sensitive place. Um, so what kind of analogies do we look for from the founding period and later? Um, how closely um, d does it fit with the, um, the plain text? And what kinds of uh, historical examples existed in a, a number of places such that it would be considered a historical tr tradition and not simply something that existed like in uh, Tombstone, Arizona? So. The, the court discounts historical examples that are too late in the historical process, and that would be uh, the late 19th century and then in the 20th century. And a lot of, a lot of ink was spilt about the statute of Northampton of, of 1226, uh, passed during the reign of Edward III. And you would not believe how much scholarship has been devoted to, to the issue of whether the statute of Northampton overrides the right to bear arms that the Second Amendment expressly uh, protects. And uh, I've been involved in that debate. There's a, an awful lot of history. Basically, Justice Thomas said, you know, that's so irrelevant. And, um, and what they were talking about in the so-called Statute of Northampton was knights dressing up in armor and having like major weapons. And that, that's not a precedent for banning small weapons. And in fact, in those days, everybody carried knives because you used them. For, uh, for eating, the, the main eating utensil. Uh, you use them for self-defense for all kinds of utilitarian purposes. So then we come to um, the conclusion of the majority opinion. Um, bearing arms means carrying arms, means uh, carrying handguns. Uh, bearing arms is not limited to sitting at the dinner table with a holstered pistol. Um, to say that the right is limited to the home, which is what some lower courts were holding, uh, is, is just simply inconsistent with <clears throat> the general right. Um, then we move on, I'll briefly comment on uh, the other opinions. Justice Alito concurred. Uh, he basically um, quarreled with Justice Breyer's leading, uh, leading part of Justice Breyer's dissent. Um, Justice Breyer enumerated a number of places where there had been mass shootings, for example, Buffalo, New York. And in the case of Buffalo, Justice Alito pointed out um, that was in the state of New York that had the 
ban on most people carrying arms. So that proved his point, according to Justice Alito. And I might add that the individual who carried out that heinous crime um, complied with New York law. He passed the background check when he bought his rifle, and he bought it in a way that was a non-so-called assault weapon, and he converted it into a different weapon. Um, <clears throat> then we move on to Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence. Uh, the Chief Justice um, joined in that concurrence. And the interesting part, the takeaway from that was that uh, Justice Kavanaugh is talking about things that are not in question in this case. Most states, in 40, um, 44 states, actually 43 because you exclude Vermont, which had no restrictions, uh, had shell issue type permit systems where um, if you demonstrate competency, uh, training and all of that, then, um, then you get the permit to carry. And Justice Kavanaugh mentioned that there's no constitutional problem with requiring uh, training, a background check. And this was very important. He used the term mental health records check. That doesn't mean you have to go to a psychiatrist and get cleared. That's required in some European countries for gun ownership. Uh, the National Instant Criminal Background Check System also checks, in addition to uh, criminal records, uh, mental commitments and um, adjudications of mental incompetency. And I th think that's what he had in mind there. Um, Justice Barrett, I think the takeaway from her concurrence is that we don't just look at any um, 19th century precedents. You have um, a, n a number of, of jurisdictions, they were in the minority in the late 19th century that passed restrictions, and she says basically that those are not uh, the kinds of historical precedents that you can base modern restrictions on. Finally, Justice Breyer's dissent, um, he goes into statistics on the people killed by firearms. He uses the term by firearms instead of people who used firearms to kill people. Um, but but he, he does raise a couple of interesting questions, and that would be, uh, what are the sensitive places? Do we have 18th century precedents for places like ballparks and, and um, bars and um, subways? And I would think you, you did. I mean, you had taverns. Um, you had um, roads that were built and which could be pretty lonely in those roads in terms of robbers and, and other criminals. Um, I'm not so sure there are no precedents that you could have an analogy with from the 18th century um, situations that exist today. Um, and he also, and this is a very legitimate point that he made, the Sullivan Law that was basically invalidated in Bruin was passed in 1911, and yet the courts have upheld and the Supreme Court itself said in dictum that bans on felon possession is presumptively valid. But that really never was en enacted into federal law until 1968. Uh, and in fact, in federal law, there isn't actually a felon ban. It's a ban on felons' possession of a firearm that has passed in interstate commerce. That's the, the federal jurisdictional nexus. Uh, but, but that's something that's being worked out now and with a lot of scholarship and, and litigation, namely uh, the extent to which you can ban firearm possession permanently by persons convicted of any felon, whether they're violent or non-violent felons. And finally, uh, the court uh, granted cert, uh, vacated lower court opinions, and remanded um, cases back to the lower courts to be decided again in light of the Bruin decision. One of those cases goes to the Fourth Circuit and is a so-called assault weapon ban. One of, uh, two of them from Jersey and California are magazine bans, and then most interesting of all is Young versus Hawaii, where the Ninth Circuit held um, that there's no right to carry a firearm either openly or concealed. I'm not sure what work there is to do it in the Ninth Circuit, being that Bruin held that uh, there is a right to, to bear arms outside the home, uh, but maybe the Ninth Circuit will find a way to, uh, to obstruct Bruin and, and hold that uh, we're gonna continue to say there's no right to bear arms outside the home, but we'll see. It's only the Ninth Circuit. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Holbrook. Uh, Professor Merkel. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here. I uh, speak from a rather different perspective than uh, Stevens and Marx, whose uh, work I became familiar with last night. But uh, I'm grateful to the uh, Federalist Society for allowing me to speak. And I think uh, you know, civil uh, uh, discourse that doesn't uh, demonize the uh, other side of the uh, aisle in constitutional politics is absolutely essential. And Stephen and I have been uh, doing this for, for many years. And uh, I will say, as someone who is a gun skeptic, uh, I always feel safe in the presence of Stephen. I'm not a, you know, across the board gun grabbing type. Uh, I certainly uh, believe that uh, the overwhelming majority of well-meaning persons uh, should be permitted to possess weapons, but whether the Constitution properly construed guarantees such a right uh, is a different question. So I'm going to take up Stephen's view, I'm going to take up Mark's view, and I'll uh, uh, start with uh, Stephen's view. And I agree that the expulsion of intermediate scrutiny from the Second Amendment arena is a good thing. And one reason I agree that the expulsion of uh, intermediate scrutiny from the Second Amendment arena is a good thing is that I'm generally skeptical of intermediate scrutiny and skeptical of tiered scrutiny across the board. After all, if you asked Alexander Hamilton or Thomas Jefferson what they thought of strict scrutiny, rational basis review, or intermediate scrutiny, they would have said, excuse me, whereof do you speak? Because they had never heard of these things, and intermediate scrutiny in particular was, as then Justice Rehnquist famously said in Craig versus Boren, concocted out of thin air by Justice Brennan with a little assistance from Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the ACLU when it became part of the federal constitutional landscape in 1976. Not only is it of recent vintage, but it is an invitation to judicial invalidation of legislatively determined policy choices based on the policy preferences of the judges doing that invalidation. So goodbye intermediate scrutiny in the uh, Second Amendment arena. Well played, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that work. Um, but I'm not convinced that uh, Heller and its progeny are here to stay. Obviously, most everyone in this room is delighted that Heller and its progeny have significantly changed the constitutional landscape. But of course, the constitutional landscape changes. Many of you were probably in various panels uh, over this weekend celebrating Dobbs and the changes in the constitutional landscape wrought by that opinion. So is it inevitable uh, that Heller and its progeny will remain uh, the supreme law of the land if you buy into the Supreme Court's claim in Cooper versus Aaron that its jurisprudence benefits from the supremacy clause as uh, uh, in the same way that the Constitution itself, treaties, and the statutes of the United States made in pursuance of the Constitution do. Well, I think one reason that Heller should be subject to re-examination is that it depends on originalism. And as Mr. Jefferson once said, uh, I'm certainly not an advocate for frequent and untried changes in laws and constitutions, but I know also that the laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind as that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths disclosed, and manners and opinions changed with the change of circumstances. Institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. We might as well require a man to wear still the coat which fitted him when a boy as civilized society to remain ever under the regime uh, or the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. Madison also was no originalist. Jefferson's take on originalism is probably uh, of a piece with what uh, today is often called the dead hand of the past critique of originalism. Who are those people of bygone times less enlightened than we uh, to command that we follow their legal precepts. Madison's take is more uh, in harmony with, with what is often called the indeterminacy critique of originalism. 
when Madison, as a member of the House of Representatives, was asked in 1796 what the original understanding of the House of Representatives, or uh, I'm sorry, the original understanding of the Constitutional Convention had been respecting what role, if any, the House of Representatives should play in the treaty ratification process, his answer was that this question is improper. He did not have his notes with him. Time had passed. Not every member of the Constitutional Convention spoke on the treaty question, and it would be foolish to assume that all members of the Constitutional Convention were of the same mind on the issue of what role, if any, should be played in the treaty-making process by the House of Representatives. So we've got uh, you know, uh, leading lights of the founding generation skeptical of originalism, and even if we accept that originalism should be the dominant paradigm of constitutional interpretation in our own time, as Stephen and I have debated many times, uh, the evidence on which Justice Scalia relies in Heller uh, isn't necessarily uh, entirely as Justice Scalia characterizes it. So 12 members of the House of Representatives spoke, or at least 12 members of the House of Representatives, comments on the draft Second Amendment are recorded in the annals of Congress. Not one said a word about private self-defense, conversation focused exclusively on militia service and the most discussed aspect of uh, the uh, Second Amendment's meaning in the first Congress was whether a conscientious objector clause should be struck or retained. And clearly, if the focus was on private self-defense, no reason to talk about conscientious objection. But I don't want to um, you know, rehash uh, uh, past uh, conversations with, uh, with Stephen on that front. Uh, certainly his view is ascendant today, commanded a six to three majority on the Supreme Court. Uh, perhaps we'd be talking about the repeal of Heller uh, had uh, Justice Ginsburg lived three or four more weeks and had uh, 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 Attorney General Garland had an up or down vote, but history is contingent. That's not where we are. We are in a universe where uh, Heller enjoys six to uh, three support on the court, so fair enough. But Bruin adds this uh, dimension of uh, reasoning by historical analogy. What gun control measures are permissible in our own time, according uh, to Justice Thomas, those uh, that uh, have uh, an analogy to uh, regulations that uh, were enforced during the founding period. Agreed with Stephen, uh, to borrow a phrase of Justice Scalia's, we have perhaps reached the uh, point of terminal silliness as a constitutional culture if our focus is on the statute of Northampton. I thought that it originated in 1328, but in any case, it originates uh, nearly uh, 700 years ago. People talk about the statute of Northampton as rendered in 1800 in the statutes of the realm, but the original version in law French. And uh, you know, I've been trying, my research assistants, librarians have been trying to help me dig up some transcript of the original version in medieval script in, uh, 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 I suppose it's in Middle English, it might be in Latin, I don't even know. But you know, why would we debate the meaning of, uh, uh, of this law uh, that uh, was enacted in England about 20 years before firearms came to England? Uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, to make that our reference point for determining what uh, regulations of guns are constitutionally permissible today, except that the statute of Northampton had its colonial analogs uh, of your well, colonial versions of the Statute of Northampton, early national versions of the Statute of Northampton. But like uh, uh, Stephen, I, uh, uh, you know, I've spent some time with the scholarship. I cannot make uh, heads or tails of it. But since Stephen is here, who argued Prince, I wonder what Justice Scalia would make of the uh, militia Census Act. So I'm sorry, I said Justice Scalia slip of the tongue. What Justice Thomas would make of the Militia Census Act. So in 1802, President Jefferson signs and James Madison as Secretary of State administers 
a federal law that requires state adjutants general to send uh, militia officers door to door to every house in the country to ascertain uh, how many militia eligible members of the household there are and to inspect their weapons, ask them to produce a musket or a rifle that is uh, uh, compliant with the uh, Federal Militia Act of 1792. That's quite intrusive. So my sense is Justice Thomas is going to try to find a way to get around enforcement uh, or constitutional permission to enforce any similarly intrusive law today, uh, which is essentially uh, what uh, a Justice Breyer says about Justice Thomas's ability to distinguish unfriendly cases in Breyer's dissent. He points out, I can't quote him directly, but for Justice Thomas, uh, some precedent is too old, some is too new, some is too Western, some is too urban, some is too English, and some just isn't right. Well, if that's the standard, if regulations that are analogous to regulations that historically existed that judges find congenial, that's not much of a standard at all. Now on to uh, Mark quickly. I enjoyed your article. Thank you for sharing it very much. Mark makes the interesting argument that even though when we are talking about application of Bill of Rights guarantees to the states through the 14th Amendment, in theory, the uh, focus might turn to the original public meeting in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified. The proper focus remains original public understanding in 1791 when the Bill of Rights was ratified. Well, I agree with Mark that the vast majority of the framers and the ratifying public in 1868 were not focused on incorporation of the Bill of Rights. About 230 members of the 39th Congress. Last time I counted, only eight are on record in the Congressional Globe saying anything pertaining to incorporation of the Bill of Rights. So agreed with Mark on that front. That's not necessarily a constructive inquiry. But it cannot be true that, as Mark puts things, there is a consensus an unchallenged consensus that the proper frame of reference in understanding the Bill of Rights is applied to the states as a matter of original public understanding is 1791, not 1868. Take as one counterexample the jurisprudence of the cruel and unusual punishment clause, the evolving standards of decency approach, much critique by Justice Scalia, but the approach is real, it lives on, one can't simply wish it away. Uh, let's talk about freedom of expression. Uh, does Alexander Hamilton's understanding that the seditious, that seditious libel is punishable uh, under the uh, First Amendment uh, uh, carry a weight to, today? At least uh, in non-Jeffersonian circles, uh, the weight of opinion in 1798 was that the Alien and Sedition Acts were constitutional. I doubt many people would agree with that reasoning today. Uh, here I am before the Federalist Society, but I'm going to invoke the name of Justice Brennan, who in uh, New York Times versus Sullivan opined that uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts were in fact unconstitutional, uh, that uh, Alexander Hamilton's understanding was incorrect. So we've got a tension between Jefferson and Hamilton, what they agree on. Maybe that uh, Angelica Schuyler was attractive, but other than that, they agreed on virtually nothing. So once again, was there one single original public understanding? That's a myth. I doubt the assembled members of the Federalist Society would say that the Chisholm versus Georgia trumps the 11th Amendment because original understanding of text is unamendable. I doubt many people here would say in interpreting and applying the Establishment Clause today, we are governed, A, by Madison's memorial and remonstrance, and here's where you know I'm going to get your know, universal pushback. B. Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist Association. You know, I, I, I doubt that uh, anyone in this room would be comfortable with applying that evidence of original understanding. So at least in some cases, constitutional meaning must change. Uh, uh, you know, after all. You can't seriously argue that women 
cannot avail themselves of constitutional liberties today. That is an inadmissible argument, but the original public understanding of both the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment did not necessarily contemplate uh, participation, at least of, of married women, in political affairs or the ability of married women independently of their husbands to assert uh, political liberty. So, so the, you know, there must be something other than original public understanding. And Mark may well make the argument that the uh, uh, class of persons who can claim constitutional liberties is expanded, but the uh, uh, liberties themselves remain substantively as they were in 1791. But even that argument acknowledges that meaning does evolve. And I'm afraid that uh, Mark reads the 14th Amen uh, Amendment uh, to be a, 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 a not necessarily a nullity, but something that does very little work because in Marx's interpretation, it cannot change the meaning of prior existing language. So I've spoke too long. I'm sorry about that. Thanks for putting up with me. Always a pleasure to see my friends in the Federalist Society. Thank you, Professor Merkel. Uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Judge Menashe and Professor Merkel and Dr. Halbrook. And uh, it is always a pleasure and an honor to speak in front of such an august group of people at the Federalist Society, the number of judges and famous practitioners and important scholars in American life today. Thank you again for letting me talk to you about an important pressing topic, which is the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms and how it applies to modern America. Since the Bruin decision was decided by the Supreme Court in June of this year, there's already been a considerable, amount, a considerable amount of litigation in the courts. Rather than sort of discuss each of these individual cases during this presentation, we can do it in Q&A, I want to identify what I've identified as traps, themes, that are being advanced in the courts by the government defendants and their amici supporting more gun control laws and less rights to keep and bear arms. I'm going to explain that not only should these traps be avoided, they must be avoided to be faithful to the text of the Second Amendment as well as to the associated history. And I'm going to lay out what I consider to be the proper framework that some of the courts have already started to apply, albeit not perfectly, the pro provide a proper framework for legal practitioners and judges handling modern day Second Amendment cases going forward in the post-Bruin world. So to start, thank you to the Supreme Court's decisions, not just in Bruin, but also in Heller. Because of these decisions and their erudite exposition of the law of the Second Amendment, we know that text and history reign supreme when you deal with the Second Amendment. Gone are the days of tears of scrutiny, Gone are the days of judges balancing away our most fundamental right, all in the name of some supposed public policy benefit articulated by a government defendant somewhere. Indeed, the Bruin Court has made it clear, as did the Heller Court in 2008, that the drafters and ratifiers of the Second Amendment had already engaged in a public policy balancing test in the founding period. And the public policies and the debates about the pros and the cons and the good and the bad of having armed American citizens have the right to keep, which means to possess, and the right to bear, which means to carry, that public policy balancing test has already occurred and it's been memorialized and recognized in a pre-existing right to keep and bear arms with the codification of the text of the Second Amendment in the original Bill of Rights. Thus, no government official, whether it be a judge or a legislator or an executive, has the legal authority or the constitutional authority to rewrite or ignore the text and the effect of the Second Amendment on so-called public policy grounds in the future. In fact, both Heller and Bruin articulate this better than I ever could. This is not me, this is the court itself. The court writes, quote, the very enumeration of the right takes out of the hands of government even the third branch of government, that's the courts, by the way, 
The power to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether the right is really worth insisting upon. Close quote. The United States Supreme Court in two Second Amendment cases, Heller and Bruin. Thus, rather than playing the role of super legislator, the Supreme Court said that to properly analyze the Second Amendment, courts must play the role of, ready for this, folks? Drum roll. Judges. They need to engage in the practice of judging. Their job is to interpret the law as given to them by we, the people, in the form of the text of the Second Amendment itself. Thus, to interpret the Second Amendment properly, we must, of course, we must, of course, start, as all good originalists would tell you to do, with the text of the Constitution, the text of the Second Amendment, which reads, the operative clause at least, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, warning, warning. This is trap number one. Trap number one, warning. Starting with the text, shall not be taken, should not and may not be taken, as an open invitation by lower courts to engage in some sort of de novo analysis or interpretation of the Second Amendment, or to engage in some sort of tabula rasa exercise as if the Supreme Court precedents do not exist. Nope, that's not how it works. The Second Amendment must be applied by lower courts using the text, but the definitions and the interpretations by the Supreme Court of that text. Of that text. Is not, talking about the plain text of the Second Amendment is not an invitation for lower courts to reinvent the wheel. The text of the Second Amendment going forward must be applied as understood and articulated by the Supreme Court's precedents interpreting that text. Thankfully, of course, the Supreme Court has already done much of the heavy lifting for the lower courts. It's already defined many of the key terms of the Second Amendment. It's defined the people. It's defined to keep. It's defined to bear. It's defined arms. These interpretations by the Supreme Court and their necessary implications are binding on all lower courts, or if I may say so affectionately, in the parlance of Article 3 of the Constitution, by the inferior courts. <laughs> so how exactly does this process work for a jurist? It's actually quite simple and straightforward, the methodology the Supreme Court set forth. To begin, any conduct that touches on the right to keep and bear arm as defined by the Supreme Court is protected conduct constitutionally. Period, full stop. Touch fingers with the Second Amendment, it's protected conduct. Period, full stop. And once a government restriction implicates that protected conduct, then the government restriction must be declared as unconstitutional and, unenforce and unenforceable and void as a matter of constitutional jurisprudence unless, unless, unless the government defendant can overcome its burden, and yes, it is the burden on the government, not on the American citizen, on the government. The burden on the government must be overcome by the government, and what exactly is this burden? Well, the burden that falls on the government is to prove that the modern-day challenge gun control law has a robust historical basis in American law going back to the founding of this country at the time that the Bill of Rights in 1791 was ratified. If the government fails to find adequate historical analogs stemming back to the founding era, and we'll talk about the founding era in a minute, it loses. It loses. That's the role of the government. That's the job of the government. As a plaintiff involved with gun rights cases, you can sit there and do nothing and still win because the burden is on the government. Now, to start the process of what is exactly is an important, appropriate historical analog, this is very important. We must first ask ourselves, what history should we be looking at? Because after all, the Supreme Court has said quite clearly, not all history is created equal. So keep in mind, of course, as Professor Merkel and Dr. Halbrook have both alluded to and mentioned, that the Bill of Rights was ratified as part of the original Bill of Rights in 1791, 18th century. And the 14th Amendment, in contrast, came about in 1868 after the Civil War. So the question, of course, is what history should we be looking at? 
Should we be looking at the late 18th century, 1791, at the founding era? Should we be looking at the post-Civil War reconstruction era, late 19th century? Or should we be looking at both? What should we do? Is there any guidance out there? Perhaps you know the answer. I'll get to that. The answer, of course, is the founding period. However, there is some confusion intellectually in the gestalt of the Second Amendment discussions today. And that confusion is not a bug of constitutional litigation. It is a feature, but not my feature. It is a feature brought about by the government defendants and their anti-gun friends in the amicus briefs that they're filing with the courts. You see, they are the ones arguing, desperately so in my opinion, that we should not, we don't need to look at historical analogs from the late 19th century at the founding period. No, instead, we must be looking to the late 19th century. Do we have any guesses why the government defendants and their amicus friends are doing so? Hmm, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this one out. You see, their motive is clear, because in the late 19th century, there are indeed historically more gun control laws in the late 19th century than existed in the late 18th century. That, not a lot more gun control laws, by the way, but there are technically more. Now, a lot of these new gun control laws in the late 19th century are a part of the so-called black codes, which replaced the slave codes after the Civil War and the 13th Amendment. And many of these gun control laws were you know, motivated by uh, partisan attacks on former Confederate soldiers uh, and things along these lines. So the, the genesis of these gun control laws and whether or not they really can be followed by a modern day court given a lot of their racist underpinnings, their ethnic uh, discrimination underpinnings and the like, uh, one wonders whether or not they'd be appropriate historical analogs either way. But again, the point is they're really just too late. So let me explain to you why we should be looking at the founding era and not the late 19th, uh, late, late, uh, 19th century. To begin with, the Supreme Court's opinions interpreting the Bill of Rights, including Heller itself, make clear that as applied to the federal government, we look to 1791, the founding period. Here is what the Supreme Court said in Heller. This is not my text. This is the Supreme Court's text. It says that constitutional rights are enshrined with the scope they were understood to have when the people adopted them, close quote. That's the Supreme Court in Heller. And when was the Second Amendment adopted by we, the people? 1791, not the late 19th century. Second point, the Supreme Court's cases on the incorporation doctrine, including the McDonald versus Chicago case, which applied the Second Amendment to the states, all make clear that when you're talking about incorporated, enumerated aspects or enumerated provisions of the Bill of Rights, they mean the same thing as applied to the federal government as applied to state actors and state government. As the McDonald Court, the Supreme Court in McDonald said, not me, the Supreme Court said, the court has, quote, decisively held that the incorporated Bill of Rights protections are all to be enforced against the states under the 14th Amendment according to the same standards, same standards that protect those personal rights against the federal encroachment. Supreme Court said that. Now, putting these two things together logically, that the 1791 is obviously the right date under Heller for interpreting the Second Amendment as applied to the federal government, and that states are obviously bound, right? States are bound by the exact same rights, prote protections, and provisions as applies to the federal government. It follows that 1791 and the founding period must also be the relevant dates when you incorporate the Second Amendment through the 14th Amendment applied to the states. After all, if you do it differently and you look at the Second Amendment for the purposes of applying it, that the federal government in 1791, you're gonna have one interpretation of the Second Amendment potentially, and then when you apply to the states using historical analogs from the late 19th century, you'll have a second interpretation and scope of the Second Amendment, which means you will have two separate and distinct Second Amendment rights in America at the same time. This simply is unacceptable as a matter of black letter Supreme Court jurisprudence. Can't be done. Third, let's just look at what Bruin itself said. Let's look at the Bruin case itself. It's noteworthy that Bruin, discussing this issue, actually cites the three cases. What are those three cases? These are Supreme Court cases. What do they teach us? Well, court cites the three cases. They all teach us the exact same thing. Bruin cites the Crawford versus Washington, which is a Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause case that used founding era history to interpret the Sixth Amendment. The Bruin case cites to Virginia versus Moore, a 2008 case interpreting the Fourth Amendment's limitations on the restrictions on search and seizure. 
using founding era precedents. The Supreme Court in Bruin cites the Nevada Commission on Ethics versus Kerrigan, a First Amendment case dealing with state ethics laws. And in that case, too, founding era precedents and founding era interpretations of history interpreted the First Amendment. So in each of these cases cited by the Bruin Court found that the scope of protections were, quote, quote, peg to the public understanding of the right when the Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791, close quote. Supreme Court, not Mark Smith. So the time period, obviously, of interpreting the Second Amendment should be obviously the exact same as it is for the other aspects of those provisions of the Bill of Rights. Finally, it is fair to say that Bruin alludes to and makes reference to a scholarly debate among a couple academics discussing the proper time period for interpreting the enumerated uh, provisions of the Bill of Rights. Um, but to me, that passing reference is really akin to a passing reference to say that there's a scholarly debate about whether or not the incorporation doctrine should be embraced and done through the substantive due process clause, or should it be done through the privileges and immunities clause. That's a legitimate scholarly debate. Professor Merkel and I might have that debate. Uh, or whether or not the slaughterhouse cases should be overturned. Another very interesting debate. But those are really for the ivy-covered halls um, of academia and not for the practitioners and judges of Americans' courts because of why? It's because of the dog that did not bark. The dog that did not bark in Bruin. And what was that dog that did not bark in Bruin? It was any kind of a declaration that says, we, the Supreme Court in Bruin, are hereby overturning and throwing into the trash can of history the 60 years of precedent that says that the enumerated provisions of the Bill of Rights should be applied equally to the state governments as to the federal governments. That robust holding does not exist because I don't believe that's what the Supreme Court ever intended with their passing courtesy reference to a, a narrow scholarly debate among a couple uh, uh, academics. But let me turn one more point here, and this is an important point because this is where the confusion comes, and I will clarify it for you quite quickly. The question is, why does the Supreme Court, or why does any court uh, look to late 19th century history for any purpose in, involving interpreting the Second Amendment? What's the point? Why do they do it? Well, there is a single reason why courts may look at the late 19th century for the purposes of interpreting the Second Amendment. One reason and one reason only. It is that late 19th century historical precedents and historical analogs may play a role as a confirmatory analytic as a confirmatory analytic, which means that to the extent there is evidence, historical evidence in the late 19th century that affirms or confirms the conclusion by a judge of their interpretation of the Second Amendment as understood at the founding era, that late 19th century evidence may be used to confirm that conclusion. But what the late 19th century evidence and historical analogs may not do, may not do, is contradict or undercut or restrict the original public understanding of the Second Amendment as understood in the late 18th century. That late 19th century law may not do that. It can only confirm, it cannot undercut or contradict. So once we determined that the founding era is the correct time, which I think it is, how do we determine what is an appropriate historical analog? Or in other words, what historical laws proffered by the government defendants would be potentially sufficient to justify upholding a modern day gun control law? Well, beyond making sure that the historical precedent or historical analogs is in the right time period, the analog must of course be analogous to the modern day gun control law. Now, while Bruin said that the government does not have a duty or a burden to come forth with an identical historical twin, it did say that the court has to look at uh, analogous historical analogs with respect to why, why and the how. The how and the why or the why and the how. These laws were enacted both at the time of our founding in the one hand and modern day gun controls at the other. And the how and the why both have to line up for the purposes of the historical analog to allow a modern day gun control law to stand. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. First of all, in the 18th century Boston, there were restrictions on the amount of gunpowder you could have in your home. Why? Why do we have an 18th century restriction on gunpowder in the home in Boston? And can that be used to justify restriction on modern day gun control laws in the 21st century? Well, the answer is the reason why there were restrictions on gunpowder in the homes in Boston is because these were fire prevention regulations. These were fire code regulations designed to make sure that the entire wooden structure of the entire city of Boston did not burn down because some you know, amount of black powder caught fire in the city and burned the whole city down. 
That was the why of that restriction in the 18th century. So there is no way that such a fire prevention restriction in the 18th century can be used as a historical analog to justify and uphold a modern day gun control law in the 21st century, say for example, limiting the number of rounds or bullets one could have in a magazine inserted into a semi-automatic uh, pistol or rifle. They would not be analogous, even though there are restrictions to some degree on the powder associated with firing firearms. Let's take another example, seasonal hunting restrictions. Restrictions that said in the 18th century, there were certain time periods of the year you could hunt and certain time periods of the year you could not. Obviously, these were about conservation efforts involving wildlife. While those historical analogs might be able to justify a modern day seasonal restriction on hunting today as a historical analog on where and when you can hunt, under no circumstances can a conservation restriction on hunting in the 18th century be a basis to restrict the peaceable carry of firearms on a particular parcel of property when they're just doing so for private self-defense. And last, we should remind ourselves, as I wrap up here, that judges are very good at certain things and less good at other things. So too with lawyers. And the Supreme Court recognized this with an eye toward the practical realities of jurisprudence in America. You see, the Supreme Court said that reading old, as I interpret the Bruin case, it basically says, look, judges are very good at taking old words written down on a text, interpreting them and applying them to, applying them to modern day uh, court cases. In contrast, the Supreme Court noted that judges are less well equipped to consider the sorts of social science analytics econometric analysis, multi, multivariate uh, statistical analyses, and the like that are used to apply so-called tiers of scrutiny or any other public balancing tests. And that's another reason why the court says, draw historical analogies, draw historical analogs, and look at the text of the Second Amendment and the history, because that's what judges do best, as opposed to get into the empirical analysis of any kind of balancing test. So to conclude, Bruin has provided the courts, as I see it, uh, and legal practitioners with a clear set of rules and methodologies for evaluating Second Amendment cases. First, the founding period and not the late 19th century is the time frame for identifying historical analogs, if any, for the purposes of defining the scope of the Second Amendment. And second, how the how and the why of the analogs really do matter. And third, any form of public policy uh, balancing test must be rejected when deciding Second Amendment cases. Now, that of course, that public policy balancing test was a rabbit hole the lower courts went down for the last decade. They've now been admonished by the Bruin Court, and now it's all about text uh, first, and then history second, with the burden of proof being on the government. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so if you would line up at the microphones, we'll be able to take questions. And I guess as people are lining up, I had a question, because I'm curious about this idea of what judges are supposed to do under this uh, new test. So uh, Mark, you had said that Bruin spells the end of the balancing test that judges are going to have to do. Um, but when we talk about the historical analogies and uh, drawing an analogy to older laws from a modern law, it does seem like we still have to determine what the purpose of that law is, what the purpose of the right is, to determine whether there's an infringement or it's a regulation of the right, which is permissible. And so doesn't that still involve some analysis about what the purpose of the Second Amendment is and what the purpose of the regulation is and whether it gets at the core of it or does not? Uh, no, I think the notion of core versus non-core Second Amendment rights has been thrown out by the Bruin Court. Uh, this notion of that there's core rights and non-core rights was a component uh, of these lower courts that embrace this sort of balancing test. I think the core versus non-core argument uh, judge is, is, is jettisoned. And I think really, no, we don't have to engage any quantitative empirical analysis to interpret the Second Amendment going forward or to weigh the good and the bad of it. What judges have to do under the Bruin methodology, as I see it, is you read the text of the Second Amendment as understood by the definitions and interpretations articulated by the Supreme Court in their precedents first. And then after that, you turn to the government and say, what evidence do you have? Have with historical analogs. Then the government goes and tries to find historical analogs to justify it. Now, you can, I think, get into a debate, and I think you allude to this, Judge, quite, uh, quite nicely. You can have a debate uh, as to what constitutes a robust, persuasive, sufficient historical analog or analogs on the one hand, one extreme that justify a modern-day gun control law like seasonal hunting, I think, is a, something that's a well-established 
uh, uh, understanding going all the way back to the founding in American life. It's been confirmed in the late 19th century. It's even confirmed today. Uh, and I think that can uphold hunting regulations. But in contrast, you have what the Supreme Court has talked on the other extreme, so-called outliers uh, that cannot be used to justify gun control laws in the modern American life. And I think the outliers that the Supreme Court most recently talked about as unacceptable for the purposes of constitutional jurisprudence involving justifying gun control laws is the late 19th century uh, so-called Wild West laws that we saw not in states so much, but actually in territories like Arizona before it was even a state, before the Constitution applied to it, before any of these things, where there were certain restrictions on carriage in the late 19th century. And there, uh, the, Supre the Supreme Court in Bruin says, hey, Look, those are outliers. They're not persuasive evidence for a whole host of reasons. They only apply to like 2% of the population. And as a consequence, they don't count. So to the extent quantity or empirics plays a role, Judge, I would say that really only comes at a very high level in terms of maybe counting the number of historical analogs uh, that existed, the number of people governed by those. Certainly a, a, a state law would be a more persuasive historical analog than let's say a, a gun control restriction in a village or in a town or in a city um, obviously, I think there is a pecking order there in terms of a hierarchy, and I don't think it's about empirics or social statistics I, or anything like that. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, does anyone have a thought about how to do the analogical reasoning before we go to the questions? No? All right, let's take a question from the person at the first microphone. David Applegate, Chicago Lawyers Chapter. My perhaps impertinent question for the panel is, what difference does it make what Supreme Court jurisprudence on the Second Amendment is, much less whether it's correct, when there is no effective enforcement mechanism and no effective way for citizens to enjoy those Second Amendment rights? In Chicago, where I live, for example, even if you have a concealed carry permit, every building in town, public or private, has one of those no guns allowed sign. So it is totally impractical to carry a weapon, even if you have a need for one, even if you have a concealed carry permit. So in the end, although this makes a great topic for intellectual debate, does it actually have any practical significance for law-abiding citizens in these United States? Can I? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is this microphone on? Yes. Uh, so you're suggesting that uh, constitutional rights should be enforced against private actors, which is you know, quite a remarkable claim. Oh. Well, well, then how else is one meant to be able to overcome the desire of a particular bar owner not to let armed people in if the right doesn't apply against no, private you're, actors? You're, you're turning the question around and asking me to defend a proposition that I do not make. Okay. I am asking what difference does it make what the Supreme Court says when there is no practical way to carry out that right? So rather than saying that it applies to private actors, I guess the question is just, is there a practical benefit or change to uh, uh, gun holders' actual lives from that doctrine if a lot of uh, whether they can carry is determined by private actors? Well, I think the answer is clearly yes. 100%, it's extremely important. Let's just break it down into two parts, really simply. First of all, let's apply to the so-called red states, the states that actually respect the Constitution and the right to keep and bear arms. I think that when you have a decision like Bruin, as a practical matter, it allows them and encourages them to continue to expand the right to keep and bear arms through, for example, permitless carry. When I was growing up, we had one state in America, the state of Vermont, that had permitless carry. Today, we have 25. And with what happened in Florida, possibly what happened in North Carolina, we'll see, you know, we're likely to see 27 or 28 states where you will be able to carry a gun without a permit as long as you're a law-abiding American in those states. So as a practical persuasion, Persuasiveness matter. I think any time you reaffirm the right to keep and bear arms, you expand the right, and the more you expand the right, and people rely on those rights, uh, the harder it is to take away. That's from one perspective. In terms of the uh, anti-gun outlier jurisdictions, remember, there's really only six terrible jurisdictions in America. There's New York, New Jersey, Illinois, California, Hawaii. Right. Those are the big ones. Right. We know them. Now, those those require an ongoing uh, amount of spanking and admonishment, which 
is happening right now. New York is a perfect example. So Judge Sinatra in the Western District of New York has already struck down a law that you kind of alluded to. One of the laws that Kathy Hochul and the state legislators passed in New York uh, after, after Nice Serpa versus Bruin and their little hissy fit they threw in New York was that you could not bring a gun and private property unless the private property owner put up a sign that says you can bring a gun onto the property. That was struck down in New York by Judge Sinatra in the Western District. And when the government asked that that order be stayed, Judge Sinatra says, no can do. Every single day the Second Amendment is violated in the state of New York is an irreparable harm to the plaintiff, and I will not stay that decision and that order. And that's, again, there's also other things that Judge Sinatra did and Judge Sotheby did in the Northern District of New York as well, striking down other New York gun control laws. So the answer is just like the Civil Rights Act in the 50s and the 60s, it took a lot more than Brown versus Board of Education to eventually admonish and fix the South to do it right. Uh, we are in the middle of that process now, and the proper application of the Bruin decision in lower courts will be part of that ongoing enforcement mechanism that will teach these radical uh, anti-gun jurisdictions to toe the line and respect the Constitution as it's written. But Mark, how can you say that that doesn't involve the enforcement of a constitutional right against private actors? The scenario you just described involves the claim that a person may enter private property with a weapon. Yeah, I think you've got it backwards, uh, Professor. The law in New York said that the law passed by the legislature, which is the government, passed a law that says that you, as an American gun owner, cannot bring a gun onto private property without first getting the permission, publicly notice permission, from the private actor. And that had two problems. Again, that is a state act. That is not a private actor saying, don't bring a gun into my home. That's, you're right, that's not part of the Second Amendment. If I say, don't bring a gun or anything into my home, well, I'm allowed to do that. What's not allowed is for the government to pass a law as a state actor to ban people from coming into my home unless they put a sign up that says guns allowed. And not only does that violate the Second Amendment by a government agency banning guns in a form of you know, gun-free zone mandated by government, so that's a Second Amendment problem, you also have a First Amendment violation by basically compelling people, private property owners, to put up a sign and announce to the world that they basically support gun rights, if you will, and that the court also acknowledges is a problem with the First Amendment of compelled speech. It's analogous to telling a pro-life organization that they have to put you know, out on the table of you know, abortion rights literature, for example. And uh, that's what I think Judge Sinatra really you know, got at uh, in his decision. Okay, let's take a question from the second microphone. Good morning. Is this on? Yeah. Stephanie Fisher, active duty JAG here in Washington, D.C. So just after the Bruin decision, there was a lawsuit filed in D.C. challenging the prohibition of concealed carry on the metro. So I'm curious to hear the panel's opinion that in light of the Bruin framework, what are the strongest arguments for overturning that prohibition? And then also what are the strongest arguments for upholding that prohibition? So a similar question came up in the oral argument in the Bruin case. Um, Justice Alito engaged in a dialogue with the lawyer for New York about subways and he said, um, what about the fact that you have, especially um, uh, like working class people, they get off work late at night, they've got to go to, through this on the subway, they've got to go into high crime neighborhoods. How do you deal with that? They're the ones who really do need protection. They cannot get carry permits because they're in the same role as everybody else. New York had said, if everybody's equally in danger, like in a high crime neighborhood, you don't get a permit. You only get it if you're like somebody really special. And so the, the lawyer for New York said first that, well, nobody's allowed to carry guns in the subways. And um, Justice Alito said, well, do they? And, and then she said, well, yeah, criminals do. <laughs> so, um, but, but then she reverted to her historical, her historical argument that, but historically you would need the king's license to carry a gun. It made me think about Lexington and Concord, like, Show me your king's license, you know. But um, yeah, that's being litigated now, and uh, um, I, I think it clearly comes under the Bruin rule. There's no historical antecedent for banning guns in uh, transportation or in vehicles. Um, yeah, they didn't exactly have subways, but they certainly had other modes of transportation. 
And um, so that's being litigated in, here in D.C. right now. We'll see what happens with it. But um, I, I think based on the Bruin decision, um, it, it's just not one of those historical examples that you could find a precedent for that'd be valid. Didn't Justice Scalia fondly recall uh, as, a, as a teenager uh, carrying uh, a, a rifle uh, on the subway on his way to, uh, I don't know if it's rifle club or, or some, some activity? High school, high, high school rifle team, yeah, exactly right. I think uh, it's actually a really easy question. The text of the, the Second Amendment says the right of the people, which is everyone in D.C., Virginia, and Maryland, they're part of the people in American life, they're the people, have the right to bear arms, which we know from Bruin is the right to carry guns for self-defense on your body in public. So that's all you need to essentially allege and establish. Then it bears the burden of the government to say, okay, in 1791, or even in the late, you know, in 1791, the founding period, right, is the proper way, is there a historical analog that shows that there was a restriction or ban on carrying guns on anything that could be analogized to transportation? And the answer is, there's clearly not anything like that. That will be total crickets. And then you win. I mean, you could then confirm it by saying that, you know, for example, when the judges rode circuit, they all carried guns when they went from circuit to circuit to circuit, suggesting that, you, you know, there's a history of actually carrying guns in transportation. And there's a famous story of none other than Thomas Jefferson leaving two pistols behind in an inn on the way, I believe, to the White House. And he wrote a beautiful letter saying, dear innkeeper, I forgot the guy's name, but dear innkeeper, my friend is coming by. He would like to pick up my two guns I left in my hotel room, basically. Can you have him give it to him so he can bring it to me in Washington? Thomas Jefferson proves your point, but you don't even have to prove anything because you're the plaintiff. It's up to D.C., and it will be crickets when they try to prove it. Let's take this question. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, the National Firearms Act of 1938 has amended taxes, delays, registers, and restricts travel with arms based on barrel length and sound suppression and other things. Uh, what does Bruin tell us about these restrictions? Well, Heller mentioned some NFA firearms. Um, Heller mentioned... M16s and short-barreled shotguns, um, and did not, this was dictum, of course, and didn't articulate what it was exactly about the shotguns, for example, that made them gangster weapons, but that was some, a, a term that was used. If you go back to the 1920s, people who wanted to ban handguns argued that, well, you can have short-barreled shotguns, and then it came to be the National Firearms Act that was proposed to include uh, pistols and revolvers in, in the restrictions. That got taken out. Short barrel rifles got put in by mistake. And, and there was, it's kind of like the, um, the sausage factory, the, what happened in, in that. But so the National Firearms Act is not a ban, it's a tax, it's a very heavy tax. It's not a, as big of a tax now as it was in 1934. That's why there are hundreds of thousands of short barrel rifles and silencers, for example, that are registered under the NFA. Would there be a successful Second Amendment challenge? Not so far, and maybe there won't be. Um, to what extent can you tax a constitutional right? There's, of course, newspaper taxes that were invalidated by the Supreme Court. Um, but most, most of the, the um, litigation now has to do with carrying arms and semi-automatic rifles and magazines. Um, there, are, there have been criminal cases involving NFA firearms where courts rejected Second Amendment's application. Uh, they were pre-Bruin, so we'll see what happens. There's a lot of criminal cases going on right now, um, different provisions of the Gun Control Act. For example, if you're under indictment, uh, can they prohibit you from buying a firearm? And, the ban on certain misdemeanors, if you've been convicted of a certain misdemeanor. Um, so, I mean, the, the so-called gun rights community, the, what's making the news would be mostly these uh, cases, civil cases involving challenges to New York, um, the, the recent legislation there. But there's a lot going on. Public defenders and other criminal defense lawyers are bringing a, a lot of challenges right now. We'll see where that goes. Okay, let's take the next question. Hi, I'm Justin Pearson from the Institute for Justice. And like some of the panelists, I am not a fan of tiered scrutiny, uh, which is why my question is whether any of the panelists think there is any chance that Justice Thomas's test in Bruin could someday be exported to at least one of the other parts of the Bill of Rights. 
Well, Justice Thomas himself uh, endorsed uh, tiered scrutiny in at least one other context in the uh, uh, town of Gilbert uh, uh, case, the uh, First Amendment case. He uh, uh, was very clear that uh, strict scrutiny was the appropriate standard, not some rule of per se invalidity or presumptive invalidity when it comes to uh, uh, content-based restraints on- And I did like that opinion, but despite my uh, general objection to tiered scrutiny, I like it when it favors the, the results I like. Um, but, um, <laughs> but no, I mean, do, do you think there's any way, I mean, I know it's not gonna happen right away, but do you think there's any part of the Bill of Rights where someone might say, hey, this is an opportunity to kind of do what Justice Thomas did in Bruin? I think if you, I, th I think for this question, you have to look and try to derive uh, where is Justice Roberts at on the question. And I think there's two critical signals that Justice Roberts has addressed on this topic. I think if you look at the oral argument in Heller, when there was a discussion of tiers of scrutiny, he specifically says, I think if I'm going to paraphrase here, basically says, didn't we just inherit these barnacle, like someone was arguing for tiers of scrutiny in the Second Amendment, and he says, didn't we just inherit these barnacles from, you know, those other kind of Supreme Court justices from years ago, we're kind of stuck with them? So that would be a signal from Judge, uh, Justice Roberts. But, and I think the other thing is, at the start of McDonald in oral argument, Justice Roberts politely told counsel, said, because uh, the council was getting ready, I think, to argue for the overturning of the slaughterhouse cases and the reinvigoration of the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. And Justice Roberts said, you know, if you're asking us to overturn 100 years of precedent, that's probably going to be a heavy lift with this court, hint, hint. Um, and I think that you may have that with tears of scrutiny. It's such a heavy lift to overturn that precedent. But, you know, Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas has indicated he'd like to revisit some of the First Amendment jurisprudence involving, you know, defamation law. So I think there's some justices, but are there five? Probably not right now, but that's just my best speculation. Thank you. So, so, very, very briefly, uh, one more point on tiered scrutiny. As someone who's been teaching in the arena for 20 years, I have never understood why students find tiered scrutiny to possess some magical allure. Students find it very empowering. You know, once they acquire the vocabulary of tiered scrutiny, they, they think they have arrived at some uh, higher state of enlightenment. I, I, I don't understand that. And I, I would not lament the, uh, the disappearance of, uh, of this branch of jurisprudence. I One more brief point on that is that the Supreme Court has always looked to history. Look at the case law on the First Amendment, liberty of the press, uh, the Fourth Amendment, right against unreasonable searches and seizures. They've always gone back to like English practice and the liberties that were won in some of the, the English cases, and then how that, was, that jurisprudence was transformed to America. And um, e even after tears of, of scrutiny, was discovered, uh, they continue to engage in this kind of historical analysis. So that's definitely here to stay. And I think what, what that means is that we give um, meaning to words like in the Bill of Rights, what was the understanding? And so it's not like um, the, the dead people always rule the uh, alive people, like Thomas Paine argued, Edmund Burke challenged that theory. Um, that's why we have the amendment process. But if you want to know what the words mean, you look at usage at the time. And if you want to change that, go ahead. But, but we lose the rule of law if we, if we don't look to history, if we change the meaning of terms. And, and here we go. Judges make stuff up as they go. I agree. Thank you very much. And just for 30 seconds, we must never forget the history of the 26th Amendment, which lowered the voting age down to 18. That process literally took a matter of months in the middle of the Vietnam War. So when the American public really, really, really wants to change the Constitution, they can do it. But there's no way that would do it with the right to keep bear arms for infinite number of reasons because it's just not that popular and people don't want it, although politicians may do so. But they get the benefit of being surrounded by people with guns. So the rest of us peasants don't have that luxury, so we have to do it ourselves. Thanks very much. Go ahead. Um, I'm Martin Howe. I'm a barrister who's... Uh... Uh, belongs to the uh, Federalist Society's Law and Liberty Circle in London. Um, and I just wanted the views of the panel on taking a little bit for further forward one aspect of the historical analysis. Um, and uh, uh, comparisons are sometimes drawn between the Second Amendment and the Seventh Article of the Bill of Rights of 1689. Um, and uh, it, for those not familiar 
uh, I'll, I'll read out the text of the seventh article of the Bill of Rights. The subjects arms that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for their defense, suitable to their conditions, and as allowed by law. Now, there are three elements there, one of which is the religious element. Uh, the second one is suitable to their conditions, meaning in the context of the time, their social condition. So, um, you know, if you were a squire, perhaps you were allowed to have more arms than if you were uh, a yeoman. And the third one is as allowed by law. And it, it looks at first as if what does this do with that phrase as allowed by law in there? Which... Well, well, the English obviously lost their right to keep and bear arms because they did not do it right. Because the English Declaration of Rights was allowed to be amended by Parliament. But keep in mind that when the United States embraced and wrote the Bill of Rights, they, view, they did look to the English Declaration of Rights that you are referring to, but they did so as a floor they expanded upon the rights here using the Second Amendment. For example, they went from just Protestants, which the English Declaration protects, to expand it to all of the people, for example. Uh, and also, they restricted the religious component uh, because that just alludes to Protestants. But here, we have the First Amendment that limits the establishment of religion and, and the like. So we learned from the mistakes the English made and the fact that you guys don't have guns over there for self-defense teaches us that we did it right and the Tories that lost the American Revolution got it wrong. Okay, well, you, uh, you, want, to finish, you want to finish your question about the... Can the, I just finish? Yeah, go ahead. Because I, I just wanted to complete. Um, because that uh, operative article of the Bill of Rights can't really be understood without reference to the list of grievances at the start of the Bill of Rights. And the grievance to which it relates is the action of the king uh, in depriving Protestants of the right to bear arms while allowing Catholics to bear arms. So in its context, although at first sight it looks terribly discriminatory, it's actually an anti-discrimination provision. So um, the law the Parliament, of course, can change the law and restrict the right to bear arms um, uh, 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 for constitutional reasons, quite apart from the text of the Bill of Rights. But that provision uh, was in origin uh, to prevent a discrimination of using royal authority to deprive... So, sorry, so, so the question is, is, what's the question? So the, the question is, to what extent um, is the, uh, did the framers of the U.S. Bill of Rights um, intentionally depart, clearly they left out the bit about uh, Protestants. That oh, I think we had an answer about yeah. the, the religious question. Did anyone else have so any thoughts about it? Points but, but, but the Sorry. other elements, condition right. and... Uh, uh, so it's really the biggest point. difference is that uh, the English Bill of Rights limits royal authority, anticipates sub silento, perhaps, parliamentary sovereignty, even in the absence of the, the monarch exercising more than a uh, ceremonial role, whereas the U.S. Bill of Rights is conceptualized as a limitation on legislative authority, absent the understanding that the legislature is essentially omnipotent. So you know, that, that is one significant uh, uh, difference in that it, it, it binds a, another set of actors. So James Madison agreed with what Bill just said. There's a notes of a speech in Congress that he made before uh, introducing the Bill of Rights. And as to that phrase, uh, he said defects in the English Bill of Rights, English Declaration of Rights, and it said arms to Protestants only and also the fact that Parliament can change the, um, that right, which of course Parliament has, has done many, in many ways. One other thing about um, the declaration that I think is, is, should be borne in mind when they said as allowed by law, uh, there's different interpretations of that and I wonder if maybe they might have intended as allowed by the common law uh, when you look back at the, the preamble to the Declaration of Rights, it says, makes reference to our ancient rights and liberties. Yes. So you, you could actually argue that there might be limits to Parliament's authority if, if, you, if you assume the British Constitution uh, had limitations to Parliament's authority based on common law or ancient rights and liberties. 
Okay, I think we have time. We're in the last uh, five minutes of the panel, so I think we have time for one last question. But if we have time, I'll do the other one, but I think probably this is the Thank one. you, Judge. Um, my name is Howard Klein. I'm from Florida. Uh, I, my question is based on, uh, on a, an assumption, which I think Mr. Smith alluded to, which is that the right of self-defense pre-existed and, and certainly survived the, uh, the Bill of Rights which, and as one of the unenumerated rights that was enjoyed by people who had virtually no other rights. In other words, the right of self-defense was assumed to be uh, owned or, uh, by women, non-property owners, even minors, people who were disenfranchised but as a, as a concomitant right of a human being to exist. So my, my question is relates to a specific aspect of the New York law, and I'm wondering if how that, that would be squared with the right of self-defense. In New York, for it is Ill illegal under their current law to have a firearm in a place of worship, even with the permission of the proprietor, the, 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 the priest, rabbi, minister, whatever. Uh, and uh, this results in a practical con consequence of a friend of mine or someone close to me who is on the security committee of a synagogue and was allowed by the, by the rabbi there to keep, uh, he had a concealed weapon permit and was allowed and encouraged to bring his firearm uh, to, to synagogue services, and now he cannot because it is, it is, it is prohibited by law. So to what extent is that, let, not, let's, let's forget about the Second Amendment per se, to what extent is that an infringement on the inherent pre-existing uh, right of self-defense, and can that be squared with that right in any context? I think that's a brilliant question. Thank you. I, uh, I would not read the right to self-defense into the Second Amendment as such. I would conceptualize it as a Ninth Amendment right. Of course, the Ninth Amendment is not enforced at all. A substantive due process right. Of course, substantive due process is a, is a legal fiction. The court uh, has instead read self-defense into, uh, into the Second Amendment. But self-defense has so many contexts that uh, go well, well beyond uh, weapons possession, and I, I'm, I'm certainly prepared to uh, make an argument in, in a great many contexts that uh, uh, conviction should be overturned for uh, uh, not uh, uh, respecting a, a right to self-defense, uh, even if that claim is not cognizable under current Second Amendment doctrine. I, I would conceptualize it first and foremost as a, a due process claim, an individual who's been convicted of uh, battery or, or assault or weapons possession in a context in, in which that person was engaged in self-defense is deprived of liberty. In the specific the context in which I, of my example, uh, is that, would that be, could that be squared in any way with the right of self-defense? I don't think you need to worry about that because Judge Sinatra in the Western District of New York declared that the New York ban on guns in places of worship, which would include synagogues, is unconstitutional. So you should just look at the decision from last week in the Western District of New York because that was declared as unconstitutional. Okay. So number one, and of course there's long history of women using firearms in self-defense at the time of the founding, a very famous story involving Ben Franklin's wife defending his home against a mob, of, a riotous mob, and Benjamin Franklin's wife used firearms with friends to ward off the mob. Ch uh, mob, check out that story. Thank I think you, you like it. There's also there's a congregation in New York that's also brought a lawsuit, and the judge is dragging his feet making a decision. They recently sent a letter alerting the judge to the recent warnings, uh, which came out of Jersey, of threats to synagogues, and we know that's a, an ongoing threat nationwide, and it's something that needs to be resolved promptly. Thank you. Okay, well, with that, um, sorry, we're at the last minute of the panel, so I'm going to say that uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.